I feel like getting a coffee. I have like water galore. But I think I'm gonna get a coffee. You guys get settled in. I'll be I'll I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Just gonna go get a coffee. En enjoy. Okay. Okay. That's better. Happy Saturday, everybody. Just closing all of the unnecessary applications. Asshole, bitch, jerk, dick, you're wrong, cuck, Trump lover, sticks and stones, let's get into it. Someone said we should come up with a theme song And I thought that was a pretty good idea But I probably shouldn't have done it With four minutes before we started Let's get into it Hi, I'm Troy Baker This is Let's Get Into It Ahem <clears throat> Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Now, when I posted the topic for today, someone commented they had to uh, look up that phrase because the idiomatic children's rhyme didn't necessarily track globally. Those of us that grew up predominantly speaking English uh, might be more familiar with the anti-bullying slogan that was 
thrown up as a flag of defense on playgrounds. Typically, this was followed by an equally offensive uh, sticking out of the tongue or, you know, uh, fingers fashioned into whatever version of, you know, the finger was in vogue at the time. Think back to the last time someone said something bad about you. How far back do you have to go? Five days? Five minutes? Now think about the last time someone said something bad about you to your face. Not like in front of you, but literally to your face. How far back do you have to go now? And how did that make you feel? What was your gut response? Was it hurt? Defensiveness? Was it a moment of introspection and reflection? How did it change you? How much did it change about you? Did it change anything about you? Did it change anything about you other than your feelings or your actions? If there are only two things that really were affected by what that person said to you, then we're in pretty good shape because those just happened to fall into the category Epictetus told us were in our control. Someone just prickled up a bit, I can feel it. Now, I'm not stating nor am I suggesting that you control your feelings. For some of us, that's like bottling the ocean. Huh. The ocean, that's uh... That reminds me of a great moment when I was on vacation somewhere where there was a beach. Um, to begin, you should know that I am terrified of drowning. Don't know where it came from. For some people, it's clowns. Other people, it's spiders. For me, drowning. Anyway, I'm out in the ocean with uh, Travis Willingham, who m might as well have gills. Um, the guy <laughs> is in his alpha form when he's surrounded by water. Um, he actually has a small oxygen tank called a, uh, a pony bottle, which he'll take underwater with him and literally just sit on the bottom of his pool. Um, how perfectly zen and how absolutely insane <laughs> to me. So anyway, we're out in the water, right? It's only about waist high. It's basically the kiddie pool of the ocean. And I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling okay until Travis says, here comes some good ones. I'll repeat that. Here come some good ones. Now, I don't know what your level of experience with waves is, um, but the time it takes to observe, classify, and announce a wave is pretty fucking brief. <laughs> so the next thing I know, one of those good ones uh, has pulled me under, and I now firsthand experientially understand the sensation of being washing machined. Um, I burst through the foamy surface of the sea, a coughing mess covered in kelp. Travis is laughing, apologetically, but still laughing. Okay, 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 okay. Let's learn a few things about wrestling with Poseidon, is what he says. What a poet. He taught me how to identify how the waves were coming in and what direction they would travel and where they would break. And depending upon those factors, whether or not I should go over the wave or under it. Going over allowed me to be lifted up by the water and for the most part, remain upright and in place. Going under assuaged the chaos and diverted the full force over me rather than through me, carrying me with it. The goal wasn't to control the ocean or to admonish the water for simply doing what it's willed by its nature to do. The goal of the exercise was to help equip me with the tools to be able to identify and better react to how that nature operated. There's a reason why we sometimes refer to it as an ocean of feelings or a sea of emotion. 
our feelings can be this unpredictable force of nature that we might find ourselves aimlessly tossed about in. But the truth is, it's possible to help identify some patterns that allow us to react a bit of, I don't know, we could retain some control, not necessarily control, but understanding. We can find our equilibrium. Controlling our feelings isn't the point. Got it. Let's just put that off to the side for a second. Refresher course. What can we control? Our actions. That's it. How we respond. Can't control the thoughts and feelings of others or the words of others. And for some, that's a pretty tough pill to swallow. Most of us don't like feeling out of control. And if a person hasn't had the benefit of someone pointing out the particular prognosticating skill of predicting how and when those waves are going to come, it's a pretty safe bet that person is sick and tired of being tossed around by every crashing wave. They're probably pretty sick and tired of the ocean and everything it stands for. How wrong the ocean is for having waves in the first place. Because all the, these waves have ruined the ocean. And if they were in charge, there wouldn't even be an ocean. The reality is, that person is standing there, soaking wet, covered in kelp, and screaming into the void of the sea. And we get offended. We jump into the water with them. Splash awkwardly up to them just to tell them how wrong they are. How the ocean is perfectly capable of doing whatever it wants and how unreasonable it is to whoosh. Now we're both underwater. Both with our mouths and our lungs filled with seawater. You know, the funny thing is, sticks float and stones sink. Both are pretty useless and ineffective in the water. I say this a lot, but it all comes down to this. Know thyself. Know. Better than you know anything else, as much as you know what time it is, as much as you know your name. <laughs> we have these great neighbors, older couple in their 70s, patriarch and matriarch of our neighborhood. And they love Traveler. They love our son. Except they call him Trevor. And yes, we have corrected them. We have reinforced it, even by being a bit cartoonish with the pronunciation, but for whatever reason, it just doesn't stick. They are just going to call him Trevor. And they're going to love him just the same. And we could get offended if we wanted to. We could stop being their friends. But we choose instead to go under the wave. Because it doesn't matter what they call him. We know who he is. And even the other day, Patriarch said, Hey there, Trevor. The traveler stopped and he goes, Traveler. He knows who he is. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Questions? How's the hair? <laughs> do, 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 do. Somebody asked me about something that they're struggling with. Give me a second while I scroll through this, guys. Hopefully you're digging this. Oh, man. Vamflet. Boom. What was the last terrible thing someone said to you? 
that you believed and how did you move past it? Man. Look, everything that I'm talking to you guys about, I'm coming to you from a position of real time. That's why, at least for right now, I'm doing it on this. Because I'm still... I'm still learning a lesson. I'm still learning how to identify the waves. This is... I still get tossed about. I still get washing machine every once in a while. <laughs> if you do what I do, and you open yourself up, people are going to take their shots. Sometimes it's from far away. Sometimes it's from really, really close. And that notion of words will never hurt me can really get put to the test. The thing that I struggle with is not what if they're right? I think I've gotten over that. I've moved past that to answer your question. For me, it's fighting the urge to jump into the ocean after him. See, I was, I was the skinny kid growing up and I got picked on and I couldn't fight, not physically. So I fought with my words. If you backed me into a corner, I would cut you to ribbons with my words. But I still fight that. You know that feeling you get when someone says something and you go, <laughs> and, and you get in your car, you walk away and you're like, oh, I should have said that. That's my kryptonite, is hanging on to the thing that I could have said that would have just, <clears throat> you know, just that little shiv in the prison yard just that's what I struggle with. That to me is moving on. So there's more questions. 59 of them. My God. How did I come out as gay? Well, uh, that would be a huge shock to my wife and many people. The truth is all of us are a little gay. Oh, dude, Gabrielle 21. What about your own inner critiques and when telling yourself negative things, how do you find the good in yourself? Oh, shit, girl, yeah. How about that one? What about when the cut downs and those waves are coming from inside? Holy crap, how do you get past that? Okay, let's get into it. For me, those, even though those are inner thoughts, right? Those are still rooted in somebody else's thought. Because I'm basic, what if I'm not good enough? Comparative language. Good enough for what? Good enough to compete with this? Good enough to go shoulder to shoulder with this? I'm still comparing myself because I am enough is rooted nothing in, it, it is an isolated thing, boom, it, I am enough, period, I am enough. But if we start comparing and going, well, what if this sucks compared to what? What if this is bad compared to what? It's the comparative language. and. Comparison is the thief of joy. I love that phrase. So I think those inner demons, that, that inner monologue that happens, it goes, this will fail. This is not good enough. You shouldn't be doing this. You're stupid. Is all comparative based upon another narrative that we have allowed ourselves to peek into rather than just listening to our narrative, which says, no, I am enough. Period. That's it. And it allows all of those just vitriolic words that people, 
people can't, they can't help it. They choose to just shout into the sea because they're not in control of this. There's absolutely no purpose that screaming anger does ever, ever. It is the most pointless, impotent thing to do is to scream in anger. Every Saturday, there's like this squadron of old retro planes that flies from one airport over around. Great question, Gabrielle. I got y'all, man. We're, we're, we're struggling in this together. It's being able to understand and remind myself that anger is rooted in hurt. Anger is rooted in hurt. If someone's really, really angry, it is directly proportionate to the amount of hurt that they're experiencing. That person is hurt. They're a wounded puppy and they're angry. Oof. Dude, Jen Fisher, for real. Where's my book? I think it's in the library. Girl, I'm getting into that, man. Way of Zen is like, I'm, I'm reading it a page at a time because it's so dense. The Wu Wei, no mind. Wu Xin, just flow. That's the thing about feelings that you can't control and I think you should control because those feelings are just like, I'm just in the ocean right now. I'm just flowing in it. Oh, this is, this is what I'm feeling right now. Okay, well, that's fine. And being able to rock with it and go with it as opposed to control your feelings. What? Controlling your feelings. I think that you can do things to help manage your feelings. And again, read those waves and be able to say, hmm, feeling that anger kind of start to build up. But if, if you're not feeling those dynamic feelings, then you're not experiencing life. You're not in the ocean. I don't, I don't think we should stay away from the ocean. I just think we should learn how to fucking swim. What else? 99 questions. Oh my gosh. 99 questions. What if you control your feelings naturally? I think you should be teaching me some stuff because I would learn to love that and, and not only understand how you do that, but why you do that. Um, because what I want to do is I don't want to control them. I want to be able to observe them, but controlling to me implies hanging on to them. And I don't want to hang on to my feelings. I want to let them, let them pass through me because I feel this right now and it's gone. I don't want to go, <clears throat> I'm angry. And I'm going to hold on to this and wrestle with it until it's no longer anger. So let it pass through me. It's like watching a train car pass in front of you, right? And I could sit there and try to get every detail with every person in their life. Ah, and, and focus so much upon how much detail I missed as opposed to go, there's a car, there's a car, there's a car, there's a car. That's the no mind. Dude, is everything you're talking about happening right now? Hell yeah. Of course, man. Look, this isn't like, I'm not pulling up a, a syllabus that I've, been working on. This is real time shit. This is happening to me now, this week. This is what I'm experiencing. That's the whole point of this, is that I want you guys, if you're down for it, if you're not, trust me, there's a lot of content on the internet you can find. But if you're, if you wanna know what I'm dealing with, if you wanna know what I'm into right now, if you wanna know what I'm wrestling with, if you know what I'm excited about, what I'm passionate about, then I wanna, then here, here you go. Let's, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, happily. And you can help me and hopefully I can help you. That's what this thing is. Whoop. Boop, boop, boop. Oh, Aria. How can I follow my dream of becoming a musician when everyone around me is unsupportive? Everyone can relate to this because all of us, all of us experience this. All of us have the something inside of us that compels us forward. Otherwise, we would have stayed in the cave as cavemen, right? So, how do we do that when no one else around me is supportive? It implies the fact that you will only do it with people's support. And ultimately, it's up to you. I ran a marathon, half a marathon, half, not like there was another half and I didn't run that. It was like it was a half 
marathon. A marathon is 26.2 miles. I did 13.1, whatever K that is. So, um, I, <laughs> we started off as a group and I was running with everybody. And then ultimately I was on my own. And nobody was picking up my left leg and moving in front of my right and vice versa. No one was helping me to do this. It was just me all by myself. And I remember at every, you know, two miles, I guess it was, then it was like every mile, there was uh, uh, what they called an aid station, which had like refreshments and there was like water or there was like this like little kind of cool aid ish kind of stuff that was just like packed with energy that you could just slam and keep going and keep you hydrated. And mile 11, <laughs> mile 11, two miles to go. I just stopped. I just st I'm going to hit the aid station. Normally you're supposed to like run by, grab one real quick, throw it and toss it. And there's people there to clean up after you. Like keep running, keep running, keep running. I just like hung out. I was like, what are you guys doing? Is there like a band that plays here or anything? And I just stopped. And the whole wave of people like just passed me. And it was just me and one person that was very confused. And I realized, I, ca I can't stay here. <laughs> I have to go. Everyone's waiting for me. I'm parked over there. I had to finish two miles, one way or the other. And there was nobody there to cheer me on. There was nobody there to run the rest of the race for me. It's just up to me. And the reality is, is that nobody was there the entire time. It's all about me. It feels good to have those people going, you can do this. It feels good. But the truth is, it's your dream. That's up to you to live it. No one else is going to do this for you. If it is to be, it is up to me. And most of the greatest things that we've ever accomplished were not done with the support of people, but done in spite of them. So how do you do it? You choose. You choose to do it. It's your dream. And no one is ever going to care about it, nor should they care about it as much as you. Go out and do it. Great question. So, um, good stuff. Oh man. This is a tough one. Know thyself. You gotta know yourself. And if that is who you are, to your core, first of all, I can tell you this, man, as a parent, I don't care. What I want is for Traveler to find love. That's what I wanted to find more than anything. Wherever he finds that, my job as his dad is to love him, period. And the beauty of that is, that's the easiest job in the world because he's a really cool kid. He's easy to love. Further to that love is understanding it. My job is to understand him, to support him, make him feel accepted and supported. But ultimately, as he becomes his own person, as he becomes his own man, he's going to have to go, this is who I am outside of my dad's approval, my mom's approval, their acceptance, their love, everything. This is who I am. So how do you do that? You do it honestly, just honestly. And it never hurts to help or it never hurts to ask for their help. Hey guys, you have helped me my entire life. I'm, I'm making some assumptions. So if I'm wrong, feel free to edit this in your own narrative. But if they're good parents, they love you. Their entire job since you were born was to kind of help. Here's how you eat. Here's how you poop. Here's how you walk. Here's how you dress. Here's how you do these things that everybody does. 
And the one thing that's really, really hard is to go, here's how you love. So if you come to them and go, hey guys, this is who I am. And I can really use your help with this. I don't know any parent that is going to reject that. You don't need luck. But I wish you all the best. You be you. Know thyself. Um, I'm glad I could help, man. Thank you. Um, bu -bu 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 -bum. Huh, there you go. How can I believe more in myself? You will believe more in yourself the more you have to believe in. That doesn't sound like some get-rich-quick scheme phrase. I've never heard it, but it's the truth. The reason why you're struggling with believing in yourself is because your pages of your, of your narrative are empty and you need to be writing them. The only ones that are in there are the tear-out kind from everybody else. People are trying to tell you who you are and you're getting all these different versions of yourself that you don't know which is the right one. And they're all wrong because no one can write your story. Same thing I was telling the other one. You, you were the, this is your dream. There, no one else is going to live this for you. So sit down and start writing your story. There's some, trust me, I do this. I, where's my little book? Right here. This, sometimes I like paper just to write down my actual story, my feelings, my thoughts, my dreams, my goals, write them down. Because there's a difference between just typing it out or even on your phone or thinking about it and actually seeing from your, this thought in your mind that has no actual weight or anything. It's just a thought, synapses firing in your brain, traveling down your body, through your arm, into your hand, right or left, being using a, uh, some device to be able to write and putting that thing down and making it tangible. Actualizing your thoughts, even your bad thoughts too. I hate myself. And look at that and go, I don't, that, no. Or write that down, tear it out, burn it, crumble it, tear it, whatever you gotta do. That could be incredibly empowering. But taking our thoughts and writing them down and making them practical, tangible, palatable, touchy-feely things can be incredibly powerful. But the reason why I think you struggle with believing in yourself is because you need more evidence. And that means you need to dig deeper into who you are, dig deeper into what it is that you want. And everybody has a talent. Otherwise, just evolutionarily speaking, we wouldn't be here. Okay. The thing is you haven't discovered what that is for you. Your, your talent will be tied to your passion inextricably because wherever your heart is, that's where it should be leading you and you will be equipped or you will find the skills to equip that passion. So whatever it is, and if you think you want to do this, but you don't have any skills for it, maybe that's not where your passion is. Just somebody told you that's what you should be doing. Dig deep, go get it. What else? Boinch, dupe. This is a good one. How do you spark inspiration in yourself? I would take off the first two words of that sentence and remove the question mark. You spark inspiration in yourself. There's this great, um, I think it's called the artist way. Someone will probably correct me, but there's an exercise that people are doing. I'm going to start doing this myself. My friend Brady told me about it where you wake up and the first thing in the morning is you write, not on a computer, but anyway, you, you it doesn't matter the size of paper, but grab, grab pen and paper and write whatever's on your mind. It can be anything. And the exercise is not to become a better writer. The exercise is nothing to do with anything else, but actually just write, just write, get your feelings out because the thought is in your unconscious mind for the last six, eight, 10 hours, you've been processing a lot. And you've been doing that unconsciously. And so whatever you are processing unconsciously, 
probably needs to be brought into your conscious mind, right? It's, it's we start dealing with it in one area here, and then ultimately what we need to do is bring it into this area and start working on it here. So it's bringing these things that you're processing from your unconscious mind to your sub, into your conscious mind. And one way that we do that is to pull it from dreams that you have. I think everybody should have a dream journal. But when you wake up, go, all right. It's like everybody wakes up and you're like, that first pee in the morning is just like, supposedly like the, the most in, insane, most potent thing that you have. Weird thing to bring up. Somebody probably got really excited by that though. Uh, yes, let's talk about pee. Um, for one reason or whatever. Uh, but to be able to sit down and, and take those thoughts that have been like marinating, gestating overnight and be able to go, um, how do I, what am I processing right now? And even if you can sometimes kind of like find it's like, wow, I continually am talking about this is the first thing that's hitting me when I first wake up in the morning. What I love to do is I love to wake up, throw on shoes, go outside and run. Um, the earlier, the better, actually. It really helps me to get um, on top of my day. I feel like I, I beat my day because sometimes it can feel like that's trying to control me. Um, and there's so many circumstances that are just kind of like hitting me throughout the day. Me being able to jump up and go run goes, ha ha. And the first thing I did was something that was hard. Um, so maybe that'll help you too. But this, this artist way of writing, maybe that could help you out as well, but you're true. It's you spark inspiration. It's like setting fire. It's just like, you have to light that fire yourself. Um, trying to crank through some of these questions. Whoop. Dude, same thing. Uh, how can I dig deeper when no one around believes in me? Because it's up to you to dig deep, whether people believe in you or not. I will say this by and large, passionate people look for people who are passionate and support passionate people. So if you find yourself surrounded by people that don't believe in you, you might be surrounding yourself by the wrong people. Um, and I don't mean that you should be surrounding yourself by sycophants. I'm talking about people that challenge you. I want to be the dumbest, slowest, least inspired, least ambitious person in the room. And I've surrounded myself with people that constantly challenge me, that constantly pull me, that are constantly encouraging me to take my ideas further. Those are the kind of people you want to be uh, surrounding yourself with. If you don't have those, get those people in your life. Hmm. Now, dealing, going deeper into what you're talking about right here, how do I deal with tension in my family when there's nowhere to run? That's a great one. Um, I think you found yourself, you found yourself in the middle of that ocean. And I think that the more you understand about it, by the way, I am not a therapist. I am not a psychiatrist. Uh, I am just a guy who is going through things and sharing what I've learned, okay? So if you guys think this is going to be, or if I'm in any way uh, uh, framing this as uh, ad hoc advice for people to be in recovery or therapy, you need to find someone who is qualified, who has devoted their life to doing this from a, from a very educated standpoint, all right? I can only talk to you from my experience. That's it. I always encourage Everybody, you should be talking to someone. If you find yourself struggling, I have, if you find yourself struggling with finding out which waves you need to go under and go over, go find someone to talk to. It's, it, it, there is nothing different between, <coughs> oh, I got a cough, a cold, maybe I should go to a doctor. The same thing of going, man, I've been waking up with these feelings. It, a friend of mine said, oh yeah, I, I gotta go to the doctor, man. I've been waking up with this this like tickle in my throat for the last two weeks. I'm like, two weeks? Yeah, you go to the doctor. But how long do we sit and go, I've been feeling this way for the last six months, feeling this way. I've been waking up with these thoughts. I can't sleep for months, years. If someone said, oh yeah, man, I've, I've been like having a bloody nose for like the last, I guess three years, nonstop. You'd be like, go to the doctor. It's the same thing. This and this is the, is, is the same part of our being. And it is justified, go to the doctor. And there are doctors that are there to help you. 
Here's what I can say. I've been in a family situation where feeling trapped, I understand that. And there's tension there. Um, and I wish that I had the tools and the equipment that I have now then. Because for whatever reason, um, guilt is the first thing that we punt to. This is my fault. And I don't know if it's because we can only, you know, associate stuff with ourselves. It's easier to do that. It's like, ah, I'm the master of my own fate. I'm the center of my own universe. So therefore, it must be my fault. It's the same feeling that somebody gets where they're like, I bet this plane's going to crash. Because you're on it, as opposed to the thousands of flights that take off and land successfully every day, this is the one that's going to do it. It's a very solitary experience, living. So we always think that we're the ones. But the reality is, is that most of us are observing other people struggling with their know thyself. So, I don't know how to tell you how to escape it, but I can tell you how to start identifying some things. And it's that if there's tension in your family and you don't see them trying to identify their waves, that's them and it's not you your job is to identify your waves and your job is to go over or under the waves that are in your life and not to go swimming in their ocean so go talk to somebody um what else when you guys are cranking these questions out this is great oh jd something how can i boom how can i embrace my personal flaws in a creative process <gasps> Because that's the point. That's the point is to be able to go. Perfect example. Get this. Uh, 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 Michelangelo, right? Who did, the, who did the Sistine Chapel? I always get, for some reason, Da Vinci and Michelangelo confused. Uh, Sistine Chapel. Someone scream it at me while I'm looking this up. Clearly, I'm not looking. Bum, 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 bum. Uh, uh, painted by Michelangelo. Ha, I was right. So get this. Michelangelo... Um, was not a painter. He was a sculptor, a lot of things, but not a painter. And so the Pope brought him in. He's like, we want you to do a piece in the Vatican. He goes, of course you do. I'm the master. I'm the best. And they're like, yeah, uh, we want you to do the ceiling. And he goes, excuse me? She's like, yeah, we want, we got this. He goes, in, in, in the, like, St. Peter's? No, 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 no. Uh, there's a chapel off to the side, a small chapel. Uh, we want you to do, like, the ceiling. It's like, you, not the frescoes on the walls that everyone's going to look up, look at, but, but the ceiling that nobody looks at. It's like, yeah, that was typically what they gave art students. And Michelangelo was offended. He was like, how dare you? Do you know who I was like? Well, I mean, I mean you're not really a painter. You're, I mean, if we wanted you to do a sculpture or whatever, we'd absolutely. He's like, I am offended. He's like, talk. It's far beneath you. Totally understand. We're going to get uh, this other kid. Uh, I think it was Rembrandt that was like a contemporary. He's like, there's a new kid ju just down. Actually, you can kind of see him. If you look down the hall, he's he's doing a big piece in here on, on the wall. Not this, not the ceiling, but he's a great painter. Um, but we'll, we'll just get him to touch this up. Don't don't worry about it. And he goes, what do you mean? He's like, yeah, get, get him, look, look at what he's doing. And from the Sistine Chapel, if you look down the hall, you can see this other room that I think of, I could be wrong, but was, I think it was Rembrandt that was painting in that room. And it was like, give me that brush. And Michelangelo was set off to work. So then the Pope went down the hall and he pops in and he's like, hey, Rembrandt. And Rembrandt was like, yeah, what's up? He's like, no big deal, dude. Just want to let you know, um, shouldn't say anything. Michelangelo is actually down the hall. Michael, the, the, yeah, 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 the Michelangelo, he's, he's down, he's, he's do, doing it in the chapel, but uh, I know you're a fan, so if you just kind of want to, I mean, if you, if you look just kind of like down the hall, you can kind of see where he's working, and Rembrandt was like, holy sh, I'm going to make this the best, if he's going to be what, he's going to be able to see what I'm doing, he's like, yeah, he's going to be, I'm going to make this the best that I can be. The Pope knew that he needed those two people to make each other better. So sometimes opposition and comparison can be helpful, but if we depend upon it, it will cripple us.
Anyway, so Michelangelo climbs up on the scaffold and he spends like three months or something stupid painting this beautiful piece. And it's just this intricate thing. He's like, look at how fucking awesome I am as a paint. Oh, I'm getting paint in my eyes and I'm swallowing it, all this stuff. And he spends all this time and he sleeps up there and he cranks his back and all this shit and he climbs down the scaffold and he looks up. Fuck. Because it's this big. He was so used to the paintings that he had done being this far away, right? Oh, look at me, I'm, I'm painting. He had no idea what that thing would look like 60 feet in the air. He didn't have that experience yet. But that's still on the ceiling. So what did he do? He climbs down, looks at it, goes, got it, gets right back up and draws this big hand and this other big hand these two fingers touching <laughs> because he finally had the perspective that he needed so you have to own and embrace the flaws in your creative process because that's how you get better and ultimately i, I love that part of the of the ceiling for that reason the big Black jug, got, finger, God touching, whatever. That's cool. That's great. I've seen that on t-shirts and bumper stickers and coffee mugs. But the first part that he painted is my favorite because it's his mistake and we get to benefit from that. Cool story, huh? All right. We got about 13 more minutes here. Isn't that cool? Let me see here. Boom, 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 boom. You guys are asking great questions. Anger comes from hurt. Anger comes from hurt. Anger comes from hurt. People lash out. Not because they're angry, but because they're hurt. You see here. Boop, 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 boop. I'm drinking coffee. I don't know if you missed it from the very beginning. So I walked in and I was like, this is a coffee conversation. Boop, 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 boop. Man, you guys are all over the place today. Ah. Okay. You see this is like a repetitive thing, right? Everyone's struggling with this. How comforting is that to know that this question right here is so similar to the other questions we've been talking about, which are the same. It's that we're all struggling with this not being enough. So you are, you're not alone in that. As Ryan Smith, Robot Ninja Shark says, you are experiencing the human condition. I love that. If that wasn't already a name for an album uh, done by Richard Ashcroft, Human Condition, that would be a name of an album that I would do. It's incredible. So, um, how do you deal with the thoughts that you're worthless, but don't know how to talk about it with someone. Well, anyone want, anyone want to tell them? You just did. You just expressed that thought, which is absolutely, it's exactly what I was talking about. Putting it down here is the same as putting it up here, going, I think I'm worthless. Okay, cool, great, let's get into it. So, compared to what? Here's the truth. I'm gonna flip it for you a little bit. Uh, a, a dear friend of mine was talking about the struggles that she was having dating. And she said, you just don't understand what it's like dating right now. And this is before COVID. I don't even understand how people are dating right now. It's like, what does that look like? Um, do you like, like order Postmates and then usually like, do you split the bill or something? Maybe, I don't know. You like do it on FaceTime or Zoom. 
and he's like, I'm having a love, no, go, you go ahead. I always, I was going to, no, 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 you go ahead. And you're like both leaning for a kiss. I don't know what that looks like. Anyway, um, so she said, I, I just, you don't understand how the things that, uh, the value that I have. So value we've seen like a global economy is just going up and down and up and down and up and down with all this whole mess. Gold, which is the foundation of most economies, um, is constantly in flux. Its value is going up and down and up and down because sometimes the economy is doing good and we don't need gold. Oh, the economy is doing bad, we need more gold, whatever. So its value is constantly going up and down. But its true worth is the fact that this element that was birthed in the explosion of a star is, is the best thing in the universe for conducting electricity. It knows how to retain and distribute energy better than anything else in the world. That's its true worth. And that is completely agnostic of anything financial. Its true worth is the fact that it is a great conductor of energy. So I looked at her and I said, you need to know your worth and fuck your value because your value is a perception and it is constantly and will constantly be in flux. Value is a perception based upon other people. Worth is who you are, inherently, intrinsically, and indefinitely. So the thoughts about you being worthless are not true because they're based upon somebody else's perspective of you. But dig deep and go, where does my worth lie? Where does my worth lie? Who am I? Who am I? Know thyself. And the last part, you just talk to 800 people about it. That's it. Admitting it, owning it, and realizing it's just a wave and you got to figure out if you're going to go over it or under it. That's it. It's that simple. Binary choice, up or down. <laughs> and being able to learn how to read that way. By the way, going back to that story, there were a lot of miscalculations that I made on that day. And there were waves that I went over I should have gone under and waves that I went under that I should have gone over. We learn by trial and error. And that is the point of the human experience, is to just do that constantly. Because ultimately we will get better. I had so much fun. I felt like a superhero that could fly when that wave would lift me up when I hit it just right. And I felt like I was back in the womb when I went under it just right. And what terrified me actually comforted me. I've never surfed because drowning, um, but I get it. I understand being at peace and harmony with a force of nature. You can't, we can't fly but like, you know, like, get like a bird fly. We can get on a plane or a helicopter or whatever, but we can't fly. We burn easily. Lying in the dirt doesn't really hold much appeal. We do that for the most of our existence. But the force of nature of, of water and being able to, 80% of our body is water. So being in harmony with that, I think is really important for us. So there you go. Thank you, the actual squish. Um, so we got about six minutes left. Um, I hope you guys are like getting good stuff off of this. The most of you hung in there um, by and large. And I hope that this week, as we kind of wrap this week up, um, I like the week end. So Saturday and Sunday are the end of the week. Monday is the beginning of a week. Some people do Sunday is the beginning of the week. That feels weird to me. So today and tomorrow, this is a great time to just kind of look back and reflect and go, all right, which waves did I not read right? And how can I read those waves better? And, and moving into the next week, how can I better identify? Are those waves going to break this way? Or are they going to break that way? Should I go over them or should I go under them? And what can I learn about me this week that I didn't know last week so that the ink of my, on my page of my story is drier, bolder, darker, 
and more full than it was the week before. Because ultimately, we're all just writing our story. And I want to write my page faster than somebody else does. And by the way, that's not so you can go, see, told you. It's not about rushing your story to market. It's about telling your story. My favorite book, you guys hear me talk about it all the time, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, was originally titled, The Meditations, by the way, it was a posthumous uh, title. He called it to himself because it was his personal notes that were never meant to be seen by anybody. It was his thoughts and the absence of his teacher who had died and him missing those conversations going, I still need to talk this shit out. So he wrote it down. And it was him wrestling with knowing himself. Still battling with all his opinion. And still wrestling with, I can only control my thoughts and my actions. I can't control the thoughts and feelings and actions of others. That's me. Um, trying to find a cool way to like wrap this up, but I think you guys know. A, it's going to be okay. B, understand that anger is rooted in hurt. Find out which waves you need to go under, which waves you need to go over. And most importantly, enjoy the ocean again. Love being in the water. Uh, thank you for spending an hour with me on a Saturday. Tomorrow, Stripe Sock Radio. It's Traveler's birthday tomorrow. Um, so hopefully that monkey boy can make an appearance probably at the end because he'll be in his nap. Um, I'd love for you guys to hang out with me tomorrow. Ah! This is important for you guys who care. Tomorrow, we're going to be premiering uh, that song, Breathe, that uh, we worked on. 91 people, almost 100 people. That song bounced around the globe, and 91 people <laughs> participated in that song and recorded it in isolation. That's bananas. Uh, we got the master back today. Uh, there's a few little touches that we're, that we're putting on it. 92 people, actually. I'm sorry, 92 um, I need to include one more person, I just realized. Uh, so we're going to be premiering that tomorrow. What I would love to do, uh, because you guys have been so patient, I want to kick it off, kick it off. You're damn straight, my beautiful idiot. Your voice is on there. It sounds good, gorgeous. Um, I want to celebrate with you guys first for those 75, 80 people, whatever it was, uh, that, that uh, lent their song to the, to, or lent their voice to the song. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to watch it live here and then we're going to all tune in to a website, um, and be able to listen to it all together in mass. Uh, I'll be dropping details on that tomorrow, uh, as well, but it's a, it's a, it's a website that we can all listen to the same source at the same time. And then we'll be able to get like, well, I guess you'll be able to see my, my stupid face. I won't be able to see yours. Um, but I'm really proud. I'm really, really proud. I think you guys are going to absolutely love it. Uh, it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. So um, thank you guys for getting into it with me. Um, hopefully I will see you or more people tomorrow. If you need just some good vibes tomorrow, um, Stripe Sock Radio is all about that. So it's, it's good vibes, sad songs. <laughs> um, and obviously if there's anything you want me to play, uh, I will do my best to do that. So um, there's a few of you that have asked for stuff and I'm tr tr trying to learn the songs. Um, thank you guys. Um, I really appreciate your support. Let your narrative be stronger than anybody else's. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay connected. <laughs>